Does anybody else want to try to introduce themselves? Let me know what's going on, which, what you're interested in, what you want to take away from the class. I've had like, I don't know, 30-ish people so far. No takers. Uh, my name is Justin Lander. I'm a senior on the TA for Formula, and I'm interested in graduating. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good goal. Justin, where are you, Justin? <laughs> Thanks. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Cool. So, today we're going to start talking about plasticity. So, we got through stress, strain, isotropic elasticity, and isotropic elasticity. Stress and strain exist on their own. Stress is the balance of forces on a body. Strain is the displacements on a body or the uh, derivative of the displacements on a body. Uh, elasticity is the constitutive relationship then between stress and strain, and isotropic elasticity is that constitutive relationship between stress and strain for a non, for a non homogeneous body or non-uniform body, non-isotropic body. Uh, and now plasticity is what starts to happen when you deform a body. So it's still a constitutive relationship, but, um, and generally from an engineering standpoint, there's a few cases where plasticity is actually useful. Um, things like predicting, well, in general, predicting failure for a material. Uh, you want to know whether a material is going to crack when it starts to fail or it's going to, to harden and elongate when it starts to fail. Uh, if you're doing any forming processes, so um, lots of stuff gets made through, through stamp forming. Think uh, like stainless steel bowls, for example, they kind of just punch metal, sheet metal through a press and it forms into a shape or a, a, a can of soda. Like the aluminum cans are, are punch drawn. I think they go through like 11 different punching and drawing processes to make them. It's kind of cool. Um, but so that's the context where plasticity is, is most relevant. In general, it's just good to know um, what's going on with materials when they're plastically deforming. And when we think about plasticity, generally we refer to it in the context of metals or polymers, uh, and we assume that ceramics aren't going to really fail at all. For most, like 95% of your engineering problems, you don't want things to fail at all. So it's actually more useful to know what the plastic yield surfaces are for materials when things are about to fail, uh, and which is also what we'll talk about in this, uh, in this, course, or in this uh, section of the course. So before we get going on notes, I wanted to show you some examples of uh, kind of the state of the art for where plasticity is at. So I, my research works a lot on nanomechanical testing, so testing things at teeny tiny length scales. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a few videos of, of where the state of the art of research is, and this is sort of where material scientists are in terms of understanding how materials deform. So this is a platinum nanopillar. So you can see down at the bottom, that's a 500 nanometer scale bar. So this is about 100 nanometers in diameter, which is about one one thousandth of the diameter of your hair. Um, and I'll show this along with some molecular dynamic stimulations that people use to understand it. So this one, um, let's see. So this one is a platinum nanopillar in tension. There's a little notch down there at the bottom and it ends up not failing at the notch. Um, this one should loop. You're not looping? There we go. It'll play a few times. There's, there's not a whole lot of ductility. It's, it's a fairly strong but somewhat brittle material. You see here the yield strength is somewhere around 2 gigapascals, which is very, very strong, which is an interesting thing about nanomaterials that I maybe will talk about in the last lecture or the last week of the class if we have extra time. Um, but so uh, this is sort of testing-wise where, where we are uh, from a mechanical engineering standpoint. This is as about as small as we can, actually not quite as small as we can go. I'll show you a few cool videos on YouTube after this. Uh, and so to try to understand what's going on with this, some researchers made what's called the molecular dynamic simulation of this. So 
in molecular dynamics, basically you're modeling the motion of the, all of the atoms in a body. So here you can see the, the darker or the, the lines that are actually drawn there are grain boundaries. So this is a nanocrystalline material. The grain size is like 20-ish nanometers. So you can see for 100 nanometer diameter, there's about five grains across. And you can see as it's deforming, you see all these lines start zipping through. All these lines are really passing quickly through. Those are actually dislocation lines. So what this plot is showing, this, this is all of the atoms in the body all deforming all at the same time. You can see the grains at the surface starting to pull in as it's deforming. So this is nanometer sized grains. And you can see the grains sliding relative to each other. So this is one of the mechanisms of plasticity. And then all those little lines that are zipping through are imperfections in the crystal lattice. So where the lattice is perfect, it just shows white. And where it's not perfect, uh, dislocation or a grain boundary, it shows something. So you can see lines up here zipping around, lines up here zipping around. Here, this, was, this experiment was done because there's a notch in this pillar. So that notch is a stress concentration, which would normally, in a macroscopic part, cause failure because it's a, it's a large concentration. And here, the goal of this uh, experiment and this model was to show that at the nanoscale, actually, the grain boundary sometimes can be the more dominant source of stress concentration. So there's another plot now of, there we go. This is a similar type of thing now just cut down the middle. And this is now showing the stresses in the body. And so you can see at those grain boundaries, at lots of the, especially the triple junctions of these grain boundaries, you can see these large red zones up here. And so even though there's a notch here in the body that would normally act as a stress concentrator, which is what we'll talk about for the sixth week, sixth, I think, seventh week maybe, um, the, the deformation actually happens away from the body. And so it's, it's happening near some of those triple junctions. So this is, this is plasticity at its most fundamental scale. We have a nanopillar deforming. We have a, a numerical model representing what's going on. This was I think, an incredibly expensive model. It's like 60 million atoms or something. It was on a supercomputer in Singapore. Um, took a few weeks to do. It's, it was a cool simulation. But this is kind of like as, as good-ish as we can get. Um, numerical, numerically modeling and mechanically testing at very small length scales to really illustrate what's happening at a very fundamental length scale when materials deform. My question was, how do you find that tiny little thing that you can like, put up to a rate of system? <laughs> uh, you get really good at testing things in, in small scales. So I have, uh, we actually just got a machine that can do this now in our lab. Uh, it's, uh, ours is an alumnus nanomechanical system. So basically you have a, a teeny tiny pokey thing um, with a very low force resolution that lives inside of a scanning electron microscope. And so in the microscope you can see what's going on and then you have this pokey thing and you come in and you align it. And the same way as you would with a macroscopic experiment, um, you just kind of slip it onto the grip and you can pull it. Um, but it, you just have to be a lot more careful when you're doing it. Yeah. But it's similar in principle. Does the geometry of the notch have significant effects at this scale, or is it? It does. Um, so this one, they actually have a few different notches where they show if it's like just the shallow surface notch versus the one like really sharp and skinny all the way to the material, then you start getting failure internally or at the notch. But it's not until you get like a pretty significant stress concentrator. Mm -hmm. Just because around this notch, you get a lot of dislocation motion. Uh, and it's not necessarily the biggest stress concentrator uh, compared to a grain boundary. So it kind of fails up at the top just because of the unlucky geometry? Basically. Because it just so happens that all of the grain boundaries there are a bigger stress concentrator than the, than the notch. If this was a perfect single crystal material and there was no grain boundaries, failure would more than likely happen at the notch because there would be, there would be no other high stress concentrator there. But this is, this is a lot more detailed than we're going to go into in the class. But this is kind of at the fundamental level what's happening and what I want you to be thinking about when, with material deformation. So there's another, actually, or more questions on this. So there's another cool experiment that people can do. So that, that was an experiment in a, in a 
scanning electron microscope, which is a surface imaging technique. There's also something called the transmission electron microscope, which shoots electrons through your material, and you can actually observe atoms um, at the atomic scale. And so there's a company called Hyzotron that makes this genetic mechanical testing system, uh, this teeny, teeny tiny pokey thing that goes into a transmission electron microscope. Um, this is kind of a, a demo ad for their, their tools. But here you can actually see dislocation motion and dislocation pileup in some of these materials. So uh, let's see. Let's see if there's a good one. This is like a, a nano uh, nanosphere, uh, and you can see like a basically something that's the size of a virus getting smashed apart. Um, probably gold or platinum. Let's see if they have a good video of dislocations moving. Come on. I know you had one. Oh, did you rewind all the way? Yeah. Of course you rewound all the way. Come on. There we go. Uh, so this is a similar type of experiment. This is now, oh, let's see, where's the scale bar? Uh, nope, they have it hidden. Uh, but here, so some of these lines that you can see floating away from that indent site, those are actually dislocation lines moving through the material. So dislocations, again, are that, that imperfection in the crystal lattice. Uh, when they move in a material, as long as there's no obstacle, they move at about the speed of sound in a material. So they just kind of zip through. Oh, this is a good one. So this is now a, a tension test at a very small, much smaller scale than what you're doing experimentally. Um, and so here you can start seeing dislocations or slip lines moving through the material. Oh yeah, look at all those slip lines. All those beautiful, beautiful slip lines. Um, but so all of those, all of those are due to the motion of dislocations. All these dark lines here are imperfections, so that's uh, due to the way the TEM works. It, it basically, it, an imperfection shows up as a slightly darker line. Um, and then you can see when, when failure starts to occur, oh yeah, that was a whole bunch of twins <laughs> forming in a material. Uh, you can see the mechanism atomically for how that deformation is happening. So you can see here, there's like a cluster of dislocations that may start off at this init an initiation site. Initially, they're pinned. Uh, here, you can see a whole bunch of dislocations nucleating and a lot of damage building up. So these are, these are again, kind of the, the state of the art for what we can do experimentally. We can actually see dislocation lines moving in materials. These types of experiments are very difficult to do. Um, in, the, in the nano indenter, they're a little bit easier. In the TEM, they're a little bit harder. <laughs> It's just adding another level of complexity because a TEM is a hard instrument to use to begin with. Um, yeah, but so this is kind of, again, what I want you to be thinking about. This is all metals, again, too. Uh, with polymers, it, it's, I'm not gonna say it's nonsense, it's really complicated uh, just because of the molecular structures and the, the crystallinity and the amorphousness and the whatever. Um, in ceramics, you can still have some of this dislocation motion. Uh, but generally it's not as much and failure happens catastrophically, so they generally don't look at ceramics unless it's like elevated temperature ceramics, um, which is a thing that people do look at. Um, cool. So that's kind of the, the fun side of plasticity. This is what's actually happening in materials when they're plastically deforming at teeny tiny length scales. But remember, this is Oh, what's that scale bar? Two microns? Yeah, this is also about 100 nanometers across. Um, and so your tensile specimens will be about 10 millimeters. Uh, so what is that? 10 million times bigger-ish? Yeah, no, 100 million? I can't do math in my head in front of people. Um, <laughs> cool. So questions, thoughts on that before we actually get into lecture stuff? Cool, 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 cool. Uh, anything else I wanted to show? No, I forgot to. Let's get back to. Yeah. All right. So. When we're actually testing things in, or when we want to observe the plasticity in a, in a material at the macro scale. So um, again, this, that was what's, what's actually happening in the materials, but 
for an experiment. So there's there's a nice quote that I like um, where uh, I think it was from like the 1940s uh, where there was an engineer in England who said to try so the the inner workings of a material during tensile deformation are about as complicated as the inner workings of a clock or about of a of a, of a pocket watch and to try to understand what's going on in the material from a tensile test is about as useful as crushing uh, a pocket watch and trying to use that to understand what's going on inside of it. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening in a material during that single tensile deformation test. And so that, that what's going on is, is the videos that I showed you. But what is happening is that kind of magnified by a couple million times. There's a whole lot of dislocations moving, grain boundary sliding, cracks opening, voids forming, um, everything kind of moving around and interacting. And what you end, what you get out of a tensile test or a tensile test, a torsion test, is a single stress strain curve with a failure point, and then you get a broken specimen with some texture on the surface. And that's kind of what you get for most engineering tests. And that that's where it's at. But when that's happening, Again, what I want you to be thinking about is what's actually going on with the materials, what's going on with the microstructure, why is it deforming this way, why do I see this texture on the surface, why do, why do I see this sort of a stress strain behavior, what could be happening to give rise to that. And the actual answer is incredibly complicated, but I just want you to kind of, that, that's what I want to be in your, in your mind as you're going through these tests. So tensile testing, plasticity, let's talk about plasticity. Cool. So plasticity, there's a whole bunch of general types of tests that you can do to get a plastic deformation. Um, the test that we'll be doing in your lab this week is a tension test. Uh, the test the week after that will be a torsion test. You can do bending. You can do um, compression. So tension, torsion, torsion. Those are the same way. Is that the same way? Mm, this way. Cool. There we go. Uh, da, da, da. Compression. And so from all of these different types of tests, generally what you'll pull out is some sort of a stress strain response. So there's that linear elastic region. This is what we now talked about where if you apply, apply some arbitrary stresses to a body, you get some elastic, linear elastic response, uh, and then eventually it starts failing plastically and keeps going and breaks. Uh, this would be our engineering stress strain. So this is engineering, engineering, there we go. Um, somewhere around here, when you see a drop in this behavior, that means the material, there's probably some <coughs> geometric change that's happening. So what is sometimes more useful to look at is the true stress behavior of these things. Uh, true stress strain, where um, you would actually be measuring the stress happening in, or what, what's happening inside the body during that deformation. Here you would get a higher stress and a, and a larger strain. Uh, most of the time we quantify materials in terms of their engineering behavior, not in terms of their true stress strain, although sometimes it is useful to look at true stress strain, um, particularly in the context of plasticity. So um, what do I want to go through? There's a few, so this was something that we were, we were bouncing around with in, in class, or in, uh, for your lab, that we weren't sure if we wanted you to analyze but I think we're going to stay against. So there's a whole lot physically happening in a material when you get this stress strain curve. And generally, as engineers, what you want to do is try to reduce it to some model. So you want to come up with some constitutive model to say, all right, after this starts deforming plastically, what's going to happen and how can I use that to build an airplane? How can I use that to model a car crash? How can I use that to, to make a plate or a cup? or a uh, soda can, whatever. Um, and so with those simplified models, there's, there's a few different ways to look at them. Uh, so you have to think about then what's happening after this thing deforms, 
if there's some hardening behavior, if there's some softening behavior. So this now, if in terms of a stress strain, uh, after that deformation happens, you can say it's, it's softening. You can say it's perfectly plastic. Plastic. You can say it's piecewise hardening, or you can say it's power law. Power law hardening. So these are different types of models now that we can apply to our materials. There's some that are more or less relevant for different types of things. And generally, the models that people have come up with, the more complicated models, actually try to consider some of the microstructural deformation in them. Uh, I don't think we're going to talk about many of them here. But uh, if you were to take, so there's a, there's a book that I have listed in the references in the syllabus by Lubliner um, on plasticity. And in that one, he actually goes through kind of all of the different plasticity constitutive theories and what their origin is. And, goes through kind of a more thorough mathematical uh, mathematical overview of them. Um, here, I'm just going to give you a few relationships, and uh, then we're going to move on to yield surfaces, which I think are more useful, more practical. Um, so here, uh, after the point of yield, so, so initially, I'm going to say, depending on what my behavior is, so different Stitchity, uh, stitutive relationships, John ships. There we go. Um, so I, the simplest plasticity relationship I can have, plasticity can such of it, is elastic, perfectly plastic. So what I say with that is I have some elastic deformation and then after the point of elasticity I just hold at a constant stress and my material deforms at that stress indefinitely. So this is elastic perfectly plastic plastic. And so I would say my stress strain or my stress in terms of my strain before the point of yield is E epsilon for uh, strain not sigma not. So I have that yield point, whatever my yield stress is, which I'm going to call, uh, do I want to call it y? I'm going to call it not here, just to, no, I'm going to call it y. Otherwise, I'm going to confuse all the notation. Let's call this y. Um, so it's going to be that linear elastic behavior when epsilon is less than my yield strength, and it's just going to be my yield strength when epsilon is greater than my yield strength. So this is a piecewise relationship now for an elastic, perfectly plastic behavior. Um, in So the most uh, relevant situation you would see this, again, is probably finite element, um, which I'm going to keep relating it back to because that's just going to be the engineering tool that you most likely run into uh, in industry. So in a finite element formulation, you would give a yield point, and without any other information, it just assumes your material is elastic, perfectly plastic. So you say, OK, my material, say you're inputting it into whatever finite element simulation, it has this a Young's modulus of 2 gigapascals and a yield of 50 megapascals. And that's the only information you give it. It's going to use this elastic, perfectly plastic chip. It's going to say, OK, well, it hits that yield strength, and then it's just going to go. And that's all the information it has. Um, yes, but here uh, it doesn't necessarily matter too much um, because we're not, it, there's no hardening, there's no softening. It just kind of stays at a constant. Um, and we're going to ignore geometric effects here. This is just kind of the constitutive relationship for what's happening in the material. What's the symbol next to the which one? Where, where you define sigma there next to the capital E? Less than or equal to? Nope. 
next to the capital E? Epsilon. Epsilon? epsilon. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so it's still just my string, which is that linear elastic relationship. Um, this this would be something that you would get out of a out of a uniaxial tension test. Um, a more a slightly more complicated iteration of this would be piecewise hardening. So you could say, um, I don't just have a yield point. I actually have some second higher point, and say this kept going. Uh, where now, let's draw a couple points. So it's a little bit higher. Uh, stress two, stress one, epsilon one, epsilon two. So now I could say my stress here is still, so now piecewise hardening, uh, this is also a very simple relationship. It kind of ignores many of the physics, but it, it gives you a slightly more realistic behavior depending on exactly what your material is. Uh, you say it deforms elastically up to a certain point, E epsilon for epsilon is less than epsilon Y or epsilon 1 here, just because of the way that I'm defining this. Uh, and then it deforms uh, with that new slope in this region. So uh, my new slope is sigma 2 minus sigma 1 over epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1. Uh, epsilon when epsilon is greater than epsilon 1. So this is just the, I would have some E here and then I could say uh, I could say this is an E2 E1 where E2 would just be that sigma 2 minus sigma 1 over epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1. Sure. Um, there we go. So I say in my initial linear elastic regime it deforms with one slope, after it hits a point it deforms with another slope. And this is again the next version of, of complicated beyond perfect elastic perfectly plastic. So this is um, uh, elastic and then linear hardening or uh, piecewise hardening. So this would be, uh, again, in a finite element simulation, you would say, all right, it, it yields at this point, and then at some plastic strain, epsilon 2 minus epsilon 1, it's some higher stress than the yield stress. And this is, again, a very simple constitutive, like a slightly more complicated than perfectly plastic, but the next version of simple constitutive relationships. Beyond that, you can start going into, so the next still simple but not quite as simple relationship is power law hardening. So uh, now I can say do, 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 epsilon stress uh, elastic and then power law. So sigma yield epsilon yield. Uh, now I say this is a slightly more realistic material model. Uh, here now I would say in my, so this is uh, power law hardening my stress is equal to again some E epsilon when my epsilon is less than my yield strength, and then it's um, uh, E or some alpha, some alpha epsilon or K epsilon, alpha epsilon to the N when epsilon is greater than epsilon yield. Uh, and generally, I would also have plus sigma Y in there just to offset it. Plus sigma y when epsilon is greater than 
There we go. So I would say uh, this is now a completely independent function. I ignore what's happening before. I still could have a discontinuity in my slope here, um, but I say it's some uh, power law, so some hardening exponent n uh, plus that sigma y to bring it up to that point when epsilon y is, uh, uh, when, my, when I'm past my yield strength. So these are all, yeah. What does the alpha represent in this case? Just some constant. Um, yeah, so it's not necessary. It, it's kind of like my Young's modulus here, but not quite. And ideally, what you would do is is find take some derivatives and figure out what alpha needed to be so that this was the same slope at that point. So it's it's related to E in that sense, but it's not E exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but just some some constant to to figure out what that slope is. Um, and so this is this is the next kind of version of something slightly more complicated than perfectly plastic or piecewise hardening. It's power law hardening. There's a few more beyond this. And so hmm, this is now, if you were to do this experimentally, uh, there's one that I'll talk about uh, when closer to when we get to the torsion lab maybe like next week on Monday or Tuesday, um, called the Ramberg-Osgood equation, which uh, basically works in this derivative, or work, works out what that alpha needs to be to calculate the derivative to be constant there. Um, but that one, so what, what you would do experimentally is you would take some of the, or you would take these data points that you got um, now actually from the true stress strain part of your curve you would take the log of that and figure out what a heart, what exponent you have, what exponent best fits to that line. Um, and I was, we were debating, or I was debating whether we wanted you to do that or not. And I don't know if it's a hugely useful exercise. Uh, maybe it's useful, but there, I, I also feel like there's just too many things that you're doing in the tension lab to begin with. Uh, so I didn't really want to throw more on there. I might, I'll talk it over with the TAs. We might add it as like an extra credit for this lab. We'll talk about it. I think last year we added it as an extra credit for the torsion lab, but and that may make more sense. Yeah, anyway, so so if you were to try to pull this out experiment, experimentally, take the true stress strain, you would take a log of your, of your strain and you would say the log of uh, n times the log of your strain is, is related to the log of the stress, and you would fit a line to that. Um, which, again, I so the reason I, I don't think it's super useful is because it doesn't give you any insight into what's happening in the material. It's just kind of a power fit. So you're talking about true stress and strain. These work for both engineering and true stress and strain curves? So these, generally they would uh, in the small strain regions that you're interested in. Uh, technically, to do this correctly, especially power law hardening correctly, you would want to look at true stress strain because then you would, for, for engineering stress strain, you'd have to cut it off pretty early to get reasonable numbers. Uh, for true stress strain, you should be able to take the entirety of the stress strain curve to failure and use that to fit your power law. Because once you start getting geometric instabilities, once you start getting necking, this is going to drop off and it's not going to be exactly right. Yes, technically, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll I'll probably talk about it in more detail closer to when you're doing the torsion lab, because that's I think where we'll have you actually use it in lab. Um, yeah, but these can be used for either to be like correct. You should be using them for for true stress strain. I guess perfect elastic, perfectly plastic. It doesn't matter either way. Um, uh, piecewise hardening is it kind of works both ways. Power law hardening is when you actually need to be using true, or when you you should be using true stress strain to get it, that hardening exponent correct. But again, these are all just kind of simplified fits to what's being observed experimentally. Um, so they have engineering utility and they're important to know. But I don't know. I I'm more interested in trying to give you insight into the materials here. Yeah. Okay, uh, so now what I actually want to talk about, which, how much time do we have? 
Uh, ten minutes. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, what I actually want to talk about is, is yield criteria. So what I think is more interesting than trying to fit uh, power law hardening exponents to arbitrary stress strain curves. So in, in, your, in your tension test, you're going to be getting a few different ones of these. What I'm interested in having you do is, is think about what's happening microstructurally to give you the behavior. So uh, you'll be getting aluminum, which should behave like you're used to. You'll be getting a steel, which might have some weird non-linear uh, non behavior there. Uh, you'll be using, using carbon fiber, which is brittle both directions, but in one direction, it's a lot more explosively brittle. Um, and it should be a fun test. Who has lab today? Cool. I think you should be in for a fun surprise. It's a cool lab. Um, <laughs> I know, if everything goes right. Um, so, so what I, I think is actually more interesting to, to use and to know f from an engineering <coughs> standpoint is what happens here. Uh, or, or for a non-uniaxial test, if you have some arbitrary stress on the body, when is it going to start deforming plastically? <coughs> So what we have to start looking at is, is yield criteria. So now I'm going to start talking about yield criteria. And for this, so this now, I, I don't just have uh, a uniaxial stress. I have some complex state of stress. Complex state of stress. So now I, I have that stress is some arbitrary x, y, z, x, y, x, z, uh, y, z. And this is symmetric again. So I'm not going to write these other three out. And I, and I want to know if I have this complicated state of stress, when is a material going to fail? And to do that, we have to now actually consider what materials we're dealing with. And those different materials that we're dealing with are going to define our failure surfaces differently. So um, now I, I'm going to talk first about, so the, the simplest failure criteria is, my, is a maximum normal stress criteria. criteria. So this is particularly relevant. Say I have now some material here with a whole bunch of flaws internally um, and I'm pulling on it. So this is an initially flawed material. Say this is a some sort of a ceramic and I have some cracks or some voids in there. I'm pulling on it in some different directions with some stress uh, in the y direction, some stress in the x direction, uh, and I want to know how it's going to fail. So this is particularly useful for brittle materials. Um, and when I have that brittle material, most of the time it wants to fail in tension. So. Uh, what I have now, if, I, if I'm pulling on this thing in tension, is eventually it's just going to kind of crack along whatever surface is the, has the biggest concentration of flaws uh, in tension. Uh, if I start applying some load in compression, oh, do I want to talk about that? Yes. Uh, cool. If I apply some different loads, in compression, I still have this initially flawed material, and I start pushing on it hydrostatically. Do, do, do. Sigma y, sigma x. Um, this material could actually instead start deforming uh, along a 45 degree angle uh, because it'll actually fail in by yielding. None of this is actually telling you anything. Um, so what do I want to get across here? So, so for brittle materials generally, Max, let's, let's roll back. So here for some of my 
uniaxial tests or torsion tests, what I'm trying to do is get an isolated state of compression or tension or torsion or shear uh, and figure out where this yield point is. And so here I, I'm getting a single singular yield point in space. So I'm getting well, so I'm getting in tension the tensile yield strength is this, in compression the compressive yield strength is this, in torsion the yield strength is this. Um, but now I I don't just want to look at what a single point is. I want to look if I'm applying some stress and some in some arbitrary direction. So now actually what I want to do is look at my principal directions of stress. Uh, and so I'm going to plot out a principal stress map, stress one and stress two. So you remember for some arbitrary stress, we can relate that stress to some principal stresses, uh, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, uh, and zeros everywhere else. So we can diagonalize this thing along some direction. What I'm gonna plot out here is actually that principal stress, as, as those principal stresses now. And so for a maximum normal stress cr criteria, make sure I'm running out of time. Uh, for maximum normal stress criteria, what I'm going to say is for a, a brittle material, for example, uh, anytime any one of those stresses passes that yield surface, so here I have sigma y in the one direction, sigma y in the two direction, uh, in, so these would be in tension, sigma y in compression in the two direction, sigma y in compression in the t uh, one direction, yeah. Any time my stress passes one of these points, I can say my material fails. So now if I have my piece of chalk, purple, purple piece of chalk, um, and I start bending it, the tension there on that top surface past whatever that point was, the yield strength in that one direction. Um, and so failure started to happen. So in my stress strain now, I would take a look at my stress strain map, figure out what the principal stresses are. If those principal stresses are inside that failure surface, uh, then my material would survive. And if my material, if my either of these, if it was outside in any of these directions, um, either above or below my failure surface or to the right or to the left, uh, then I would say this would failure. So now, this is generally what I'm going to try to look at. And this, uh, we're already out of time. I'll go through this again tomorrow in a way that makes a little bit more sense. But uh, what I'm going to do now is plot out surfaces in principal stress space. So in terms of my principal stresses, sigma 1, sigma 2, if it lies inside those surfaces, it'll survive, and if it lies outside of those surfaces, it'll fail. Um, and this is what I think is a much more useful way of considering engineering stress and strains are. Uh, okay, be sure to grab the homeworks that are going around, and we'll keep talking about this tomorrow.